Welcome to This Week in Royal History, where we take a look at the captivating stories of royals from around the world, across various centuries, and explore the impact that they had on history and society. Through their triumphs and tragedies, these royals shape the world we live in today, leaving behind legacies that continue to inspire and intrigue us. So sit back, relax, and journey with us through time as we explore the enchanting and sometimes tragic lives of the royals who have captured our hearts and imaginations throughout the ages. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's all totally free with no catch. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Born amidst grandeur on a chilly December morning in 1421, the infant king, Henry, was thrust into the world of thrones and power. The only sprout of the royal duo of Henry V of England and Catherine of Valois, his destiny was etched in stone before he could even babble his first words. Henry was barely a toddler when the breath of fate swept away his royal father, crowning him as king of England. And if that wasn't enough... Death also knocked at his grandfather, Charles VI of France's door. The Treaty of Troyes, like a skilled puppet master, directed his tiny hands towards the French throne as well, making him a pawn and a prince in the intense game of power that was the Hundred Years' War and the Wars of the Roses. In 1445, as the April sun bathed the world in a soft glow, Henry, still in his youthful 20s, wed the 15-year-old Margaret of Anjou. The joyous union bore fruit in October 1453 when their son, Edward of Westminster, emerged into the world, a symbol of hope and continuity. However, shadows soon began to gather around the royal family. Henry's mind, once a fortress of wit and wisdom, was besieged by insidious enemy, instability. The end of the Hundred Years' War in 1453, a bitter loss for England, marked the beginning of his mental decline. The kingdom watched in despair as their beloved king started slipping away, and his throne at the mercy of ambitious claimants. The Duke of York, armed with the royal lineage traced back to Edward III, wasted no time in staking his claim, labeling Henry as unfit to rule. The gauntlet was thrown and the Wars of the Roses erupted, splitting the realm into two bickering houses, Lancaster, steadfast behind Henry, and York, hungry for power. In 1461, the Lancastrian forces were vanquished at the Battle of Towton. Their defeat was a grim herald of change as Edward IV seized the crown and cast Henry into the shadows. But the play of destiny wasn't over yet. In a surprising turn, Henry reclaimed the throne in 1470, albeit briefly. His reign was snuffed out in 1471 at the Battle of Tewkesbury by Edward IV. The battle, as violent as it was decisive, claimed the life of Henry's heir, Edward of Westminster. Captured and stripped of power, Henry was sent to the Tower of London, his royal chambers replaced by the chilling stone walls of a cell. On the 21st of May in 1471, under the melancholic gaze of the tower, King Henry breathed his last. Speculations ran rife, with whispers of a royal execution filling the air. His final resting place was St. George's Chapel, a somber reminder of the once mighty king. With the death of Henry and his young son, the last vestiges of Lancaster's reign were extinguished. And an interesting fact Henry VI is the only king to have coronations in both England and in France. On the 21st of May, 1527, a child of destiny was born under the royal canopy of Spain. This baby boy was the future Philip II. 
a gift to Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor, and his wife, Isabella of Portugal. His life would be a grand carousel of titles, King of Spain, Portugal, Naples, and Sicily, as well as a king consort of England and Ireland, a title won by marriage rather than conquest. His heart beat fervently for Catholicism, and he saw himself as its mighty bulwark against the sweeping tide of Protestant revolutions. One of his most audacious moves was in 1588, when he unfurled the sails of the renowned Spanish Armada. His sights were set on the English throne, then occupied by the Protestant Queen Elizabeth I. Philip hoped to dethrone her and usher England back into the Catholic fold. However, both man and nature conspired against him, sending his invincible armada into the abyss of defeat. In the grand chessboard of his life, Philip played the game of matrimony four times. Not quite a Henry VIII. In 1543, Philip wed Maria Manuela, Princess of Portugal, a double first cousin. Their union bore him a son who, like a fleeting flame, lived for a mere 23 years and left no descendants. Maria herself succumbed just four days after giving birth in 1545, leaving Philip a young widower. In 1554, he married Queen Mary I of England, a union more political than romantic. Their marriage bore no children, and Mary's death in 1558 brought an end to Philip's reign over England and Ireland. In 1559, Philip chose Anne of Austria, his own niece, as his fourth wife. They had five children, but only one, the future Philip III, would escape the cruel hand of fate and live into adulthood. Anne herself passed away in 1580 after giving birth to their daughter. Philip II died on the 13th of September, 1598, near Madrid, Spain. His name is etched in the annals of history and his legacy continues to echo through the ages. In the tapestry of historical drama, few threads are as colorful as the matrimonial saga of King Henry VIII. Bound in matrimony for a solid 24 years to Catherine of Aragon, their union was to face an unforeseen storm. On the 23rd of May, 1533, a thunderbolt struck in the form of a declaration by Thomas Cranmer. He decreed that Henry and Catherine's marriage was illegal, basing his claim on a crucial detail that Catherine's previous marriage to Henry's brother Arthur had been consummated. Henry VIII, a man perpetually dissatisfied by his lack of a male heir with Catherine, saw in this verdict a golden ticket. The path was clear for him to legally marry Anne Boleyn, a woman who promised him a fresh start. Yet Catherine, the discarded queen, was a beacon of defiance. She vehemently maintained that her marriage with Arthur was void of intimacy until his untimely death. Insisting on her rightful claim to the throne, she wore the title Queen of England as a mantle of unyielding dignity until her death in 1536, against her husband's wishes. A fascinating tidbit to add a little spice to this royal drama that Henry and Catherine's union, though fraught with discord, was longer than all of his other marriages combined. Quite an achievement for the notoriously fickle Henry VIII. On a balmy summer's day, the 11th of August, 1467, the walls of Windsor Castle reverberated with the birth cries of a royal baby. This was no ordinary child, but Princess Mary, born to the formidable Edward IV of England and the captivating Elizabeth Woodville. A cherished jewel in their royal crown, she was the second sprout in their blossoming family tree. A mere teenager in 1480, Mary found herself bestowed with the noble title of Lady of the Garter. She accepted this honor alongside her two sisters, their young faces glowing with pride beneath the weight of their newly acquired status. But as fate would have it, this promising star was destined for a tragically brief dance across the stage of life. It was on the 23rd of May, 1482, that Mary breathed her last in the historic city of Greenwich. She was just 14. 
Her mortal remains were interred within the hallowed grounds at St. George's Chapel, a stone edifice that stands as a silent testament to the ephemeral life of the princess. The echoes of her short but vibrant existence continue to resonate within the historic walls of the castle she once called home. In the grand theater of history, the Scottish crown often found itself the main prop in a drama of power and legacy. This was certainly the case on the 23rd of May, 1153, when the grand old King David I died. The baton of royalty was passed on not to David's son, Earl Henry, the expected heir, but to a young, untested player on the stage, Malcolm IV. The stage was set for Malcolm's rise after the quill of fate inscribed an unexpected twist in 1152. Earl Henry, his father, met an untimely end, leaving a young Malcolm next in line for the throne. Suddenly, the young prince was thrust into the limelight as the King of Scotland. However, Malcolm's reign, much like a flickering candle in a storm, was extinguished prematurely. At the age of 24 in 1165, he died at the age of 24 in 1165. His youthful face never graced the altar of marriage, and he left no issue to carry forth his legacy. Thus, the weighty crown of Scotland found itself seeking another head to rest upon. It found its new home with William, Malcolm's younger brother, a fresh protagonist in the ever-unfolding saga of Scottish royalty. In the echoing halls of Christ Church Cathedral in Dublin, a peculiar coronation took place on the 24th of May, 1487. Amidst the gold and glitter of a royal ceremony, a boy whose age hovers mysteriously between 10 and 15 was crowned King of England. History has known him as Lambert Simnel, though that may not have been his true name. Cloaked in the regal mantle, he claimed to be none other than Edward Plantagenet, the offspring of George, Duke of Clarence, and nephew to Edward IV. His true identity, however, remains a tantalizing mystery lost to the sands of time. In a twist of irony, the real Edward, Earl of Warwick, was tucked away in the Tower of London. Though alive and well, rumors of his demise ran rampant. The throne was occupied by Henry VII, who had seized it on the battlefield in 1485, but the Yorkist supporters were itching for a comeback. Enter John de la Pole, Earl of Lincoln, a man with a plan. He rallied troops to the banner of the pretend Edward VI, and in June 1486 faced Henry's forces head-on. The war drums fell silent with a crushing victory for Henry, and Lincoln met his end on the battlefield. As for the young Lambert, his age won him Henry's pardon. He had been too young to be the mastermind behind the plot. Rather than send him back into the jaws of a conspiracy, Henry put him to work. From the royal kitchens to the role of royal falconer, Lambert Simnel lived a life of quiet service, far from the turmoil of his early years. He passed away sometime between 1525 and 1535, leaving behind a story as enigmatic as the boy king himself. Under the looming shadow of Kensington Palace, on a day painted with the vibrant colors of spring on the 24th of May, 1819, a child of destiny was born, Alexandrina Victoria. Her parents, Prince Edward and Victoria of saxe coburg Salfield had cunningly ensured her birth in England. They were gambling on the chance that their precious daughter, the sole surviving child of George III's first four sons, might one day wear the crown. And so fate played its hand early, when Victoria's father passed away before she could even celebrate her first birthday. Her upbringing was thus orchestrated by her mother, under the watchful eye of the infamous Kensington system. This system isolated Victoria from the world of children, entombing her in a fortress of solitude. The specter of a regency loomed over her young shoulders, with her mother and comptroller John Conroy positioned to seize the reins. But fortune favored Victoria. As her 18th birthday candles flickered in May 1835, 
she evaded the clutches of a regency. The following month, her uncle, King William IV, died, clearing the path for her ascension to the throne. Her majestic coronation took place in Westminster Abbey in June 1838. Now, Cupid's arrow found its mark when Victoria met her first cousin, Albert of Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha. They married in February 1840, and their love bloomed into a garden of nine children. However, 1861 brought a chilling winter, snatching away both her mother and beloved husband within a nine-month span. Plunged into a sea of grief, Victoria clung to her mourning garb till the end of her life. Her reign, extending over 63 years, seven months, and two days, etched her name as the longest reigning British monarch until her record was broken by her great-great-granddaughter, Queen Elizabeth II, in 2015. Victoria's intimate thoughts and experiences live on through her detailed journals, revealing a monarch both grand and vulnerable. Notably, Victoria unknowingly passed on the curse of hemophilia, a blood clotting disorder, to her descendants, affecting her lineage profoundly. Her royal influence radiated across Europe, earning her the title Grandmother of Europe. Her reign, known as the Victorian Era, witnessed the zenith of the British Empire and monumental strides in industrial and technological progress. Thus, Victoria's legacy, laced with power and tragedy, continues to echo through time. In the captivating world of medieval England, a remarkable woman named Margaret Plantagenet graced the world on the 14th of August, 1473. Born to George, Duke of Clarence, and Isabel Neville, she had royal connections through her uncles, Edward IV and Richard III, and her grandfather, Richard Neville, the 16th Earl of Warwick, known as the Kingmaker. Tragedy struck Margaret at a tender age. Her mother passed away when she was only three, followed by her father's execution for treason just two years later. The political landscape further shifted when Richard III claimed the throne after the death of Edward IV. However, his reign was cut short when he was defeated at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485, and Henry VII emerged as the new king, establishing the Tudor dynasty. Margaret's family faced continued challenges under Henry VII's rule. Her brother, Edward, was imprisoned in the Tower of London due to his potential claim to the throne. Meanwhile, Margaret, widowed with five children and no income or inheritance, endured poverty for four years, finding solace at Sion Abbey. Fortune favored Margaret with the ascension of Henry VIII to the throne in 1509. She caught the attention of her cousin and new king and became one of Queen Catherine of Aragon's ladies-in-waiting. In 1512, Margaret received the family title of Countess of Salisbury and some lands of the earldom, becoming one of the wealthiest peers in England. However, fate took a cruel turn. In November 1538, Margaret, her eldest son, and cousin were arrested for an alleged conspiracy to overthrow Henry VIII. Stripped of her lands and titles, Margaret, now known as Margaret Pole, endured two and a half years of captivity in the Tower of London. Driven by his fear of potential claimants to the throne, Henry VIII ordered Margaret's execution. On the 27th of May, 1541, at the age of 67, Margaret met her tragic end. Eyewitnesses described a horrific scene as an inexperienced executioner clumsily hacked her head and shoulders to pieces. Yet Margaret's story endured beyond her time. In 1886, she was made a saint by the Catholic Church for her unwavering faith and strength and is now recognized throughout the ages. That concludes this week in royal history. A special shout out to my newest patrons, Samantha D and Maggie K. Patrons get commercial free episodes, exclusive content, and more. 
you're interested in learning more, check out the link in the show notes or go to patreon.com slash Tudor's Dynasty to learn more. I'm Rebecca Larson. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.